Welcome back to Behind the Lines. I'm Kevin Riley, and once again in a series of streaming episodes where we bring in athletes and behind the scenes sort of information that you would have never got in the paper or maybe even on the internet, some really interesting athletes that we've had. And today, I have one of the more interesting people in the sports field, especially well known in Philadelphia, Mr. Ray Didinger. Ray and I go back to 1973 when I was on the Eagles football team and first got to meet him. He was a beat reporter. And from working with the newspapers in Philadelphia, and I believe he worked for the Bulletin, the Enquirer, and anybody that would have him because he was so good, he's also an author. And um, he's written the Philadelphia Eagles Encyclopedia. How about a book called One Last Read? All of his really, really good columns. The ultimate book on sports movies that he wrote with Glenn Macnow, and now his latest one, Finished Business, 50 Years of Headlines, Heroes, and, heart, and Heartache. Oh boy, I know where the heartache comes from. But anyway, please welcome my guest tonight and one of my good friends, Ray Diddy Dittinger. Ray, glad to have you on the show. Great to be with you again, Kevin. I, I, do, remember, uh, I do remember back to the 70s and... I remember working that locker room as a beat reporter for the Philadelphia Bulletin, and I have to tell you, you were one of the best interviews in the room. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. That's because I was a Villanova graduate, you know. <laughs> and no, anyway, uh, Ray, one of the things that uh, we got to talk about before we talk about this wonderful uh, play that you have, and that's going to be the bulk of what we talk about today, but one of the things we got to talk about is this Eagles team that is one and two and just look like to be a big mess on Monday night, they had more penalties than they had yards rushing, and that included the nine carries by uh, Jalen Hurts. And that's just incredible. And some of the play calling wasn't there. And here we go again. This is the fifth year where we've had early injuries to starting offensive linemen. It's almost like a plague. So after what you saw uh, last Monday night and what I saw, what is the possibility of us getting back on track in a short period of time? I mean, you can always hope for the best, but um, you can't be too optimistic. I mean, one of the things that's really worrisome about the spot they're in right now is this stretch of games they have coming up. I mean, these next four games, uh, they got Kansas City this week. Um, they've got undefeated Carolina on the road the following week. Then they come back on a short week and play the Super Bowl champion, <laughs> Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, and then they go out on the road to Las Vegas and play a Raider team that looks surprisingly good. Um, and that was one of the reasons why I thought the game in Dallas was such a big game. Um, because my thinking was, man, if they lose this game, they could very easily be one and six. Yeah, that's what everybody uh, said. When you're talking about a rookie head coach in a town like Philadelphia, you don't want to be one in six because it raises all kinds of questions that you'd rather not answer. But honestly, at this point, we, we certainly know they're going to be underdogs in all those games. Doesn't mean you're going to lose them all, but they're certainly going to be underdogs. And there is the very real chance they could be one in six, which is, you know, hey, listen, Kevin, you've been down that road, I've been down that road, and it's not a good place to be. No fun whatsoever. One of the questions I have for you, because you've been around the sport so long, and I have a little bit of a, you know, a theory from some, I think, really good, credible evidence, but when Dick Vermeil came into the NFL and with the Philadelphia Eagles and he saw that he didn't have draft choices and he just had free agents and he was going to have to get by that year with what he had, he worked these guys pretty hard, two and a half hours in the morning, two and a half hours in the afternoon, fundamentals, fundamentals. He worked himself hard. And you wonder now, uh, a new coach like Sirianni, although he's been on the NFL sidelines, comes in and now he's running the show. He's the head coach. And they have 90-minute practices. And a lot of what he's been doing, uh, you know, preseason and all the way up till now, is teaching fundamentals. Well, that's all good and, and, and well in its own place. But when you've got other teams you've got to face that have tenured coaches, who are fine-tuning, you know, what they did from last year to this year. They trust their coordinators. They know that they're good. They know how to trust them. It is really an uphill battle for any new coach to come in 
and really put together a strong program right off the bat. No question. And that was one of the concerns I had when they hired Nick and then when Nick began assembling his staff. Um, I, not, not to say that I doubted that they could do it because you got to give everybody a chance. Um, but I just thought when you've got a guy like Nick, who's 39 years old, which is young, um, coming in, becoming a head coach for the first time, never been a head coach at any level. Now he's going to come in here at 39 and try to be a head coach in the NFL in this town. Um, I just thought, okay, let's see what kind of a team, let's see what kind of a staff he puts together. Uh, and I, I kind of hoped, kind of wished that he would on that staff put in a couple of veteran coaches, a couple of guys that have been around a while, maybe a couple of guys that have been head coaches before that could, um, you know, when you hit a rough patch and it doesn't get much rougher than the, this week coming off the game in Dallas, that could come in and say, listen, Nick, you know, we're, we're on the right track here. You know, we're working with these guys. We've got to, we've got to fix some things for sure. But, you know, we can get through this. Um, the problem is when you're surrounded by a bunch of guys that are as young as you are, uh, and a lot of them having been elevated to positions that they've never held before, your offensive and your defensive coordinators, uh, now, now you're all going through it together for the first time. And I just kind of think that having a couple of those veteran voices in the coaching room would have been a good idea. And now, you know, now I wonder, you know, how much that's, how much they're missing that. Because if I had been inside giving them some advice, I would have said, look, hire good guys, hire quality guys, hire guys, you know, I mean, I'm fine with that. But somewhere in there, get yourself a couple of veteran coaches that have been around the block a few times that when... When things get when you know when the, when the walls start trembling a little bit, you have a couple of old heads in there that can settle things down. Ray, I couldn't agree with you more, and I even said um, uh, previously that I was concerned about that. Even if that position was sort of like you know a, a, some kind of new title, but I just was thinking about Nick getting back to his office or you know getting back into Philly from the, from the game in Dallas and not having anybody to say, hold on a second. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of a former head coach. Even if this former head coach had been fired once or twice, at least they know where the landmines are, and that can help you. But I couldn't agree with you more that he would need somebody to settle himself down and the other coaches to say, we're going to be all right. You know, one of the things that um, I really loved about a guy by the name of Dick LeBeau, who was a special teams coach, uh, when I was playing with the Eagles, you know, occasionally we would have a kickoff run back for a touchdown or a punt. Not very often, but occasionally. And boy, when you came off, you were bewildered. Like, what happened? And the last thing you need is somebody getting in your face and telling you you made a mistake or this happened because they really don't know what happened until they watch the film. And LeBeau would gather us and say, okay, everybody take it easy. We're going to fix it. We're going to find out what happened, and we're going to fix it. And there was something about a calmness that came over us and says, huh, he's, he's the guy, he, he'll know what to do to fix it because we don't want to go out onto the next punt or kickoff and do the same thing. And so, you know, I, I couldn't agree with you more that you need that kind of uh, older head that's steady with it, everything and can say, you know, hey, you know what, we might go in one and six, but the second half of our season, I don't think we're on an airplane much and these guys will get better. I don't know. I, I really believe what there's there's something to be said about that. Yeah, I, I think so too, Kevin. I you know when I think about um, the way Dick Vermeil put his first staff together, I mean, as Marion Campbell, who certainly a veteran coach, he brings Sid Gilman out of retirement. He brings Sid Gilman out of the Hall of Fame for God's sakes, and puts him on the coaching staff. Uh, and those guys were invaluable. They really were. And you know, Dick will tell you today that that Sid Gilman was a great sounding board for him. You know, because Sid and, and Dick had very different philosophies of offense. You know, Dick was a very meat and potatoes, let's run the ball, run the ball, run the ball kind of guy. Uh, whereas Sid was, I mean, he was one of the, the, the really the forerunners of the West Coast offense. And he wanted a lot of formations, a lot of motion, and chucked that ball down the field. So the, between the two of them, even though they disagreed, they've met in the middle and came up with a really good offense. But I remember Dick telling me one time, that he and Sid were in a meeting with the whole offensive staff and Dick was going over his game plan and, you know, run Montgomery here, we're going to run Montgomery there, we're going to run Montgomery. And, and Sid said, 
Dick, I have never been around someone who worked so hard to gain three yards. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm sure it wasn't what Dick wanted to hear, but maybe it was something he needed to hear. Yeah. Uh, and that kind of veteran voice, I think, is important. You know, when Andy Reid came in here, he had never been a head coach before, uh, and he was a young guy who was unknown. But his first hire was Jim Johnson, who was an NFL lifer and had been around and had seen it all and done it all. And Jim Johnson was an incredibly valuable guy Absolutely. on the staff that Andy Reid built and lasted here for 14 years. So, yeah, I think having – look, coaching staffs are enormous now, 20, 25 guys. If they're all as young as you are, something's wrong. You, know, you need to have a couple guys in there that are experienced and can be sort of that old veteran guy that – when you have a week like this and you feel like the world's coming to an end, that can say, look, don't worry about it. We're three weeks into the season, long way to go. Let's just keep grinding. So we're going to leave it there with the Eagles. We'll hope for the best going forward. Maybe we can upset somebody in the next couple of weeks and get to that easier schedule with maybe some more experience. But, Ray, I know you've watched the show back in your youth, and there's probably some young people watching this that wouldn't remember it, but it was called This Is Your Life. So I want to take this opportunity before we get into talking about your play, which is Tommy and Me, which is just terrific. I've already seen it once. But I want to talk about how you became an Eagles fan. I mean, I know that, you know, I'll go back and I'll get you started. You uh, had a grandfather that uh, owned a bar in Philly, and you were cleaning up in there on Sundays. And I think you told me once he had like 40 tickets uh, to the Eagles uh, games at uh, Franklin Field and a bus that went there. And how did you get started with this, you know, you know, attachment to the Philadelphia Eagles? Well, actually, it, it, it ties into the whole Tommy McDonald story. Uh, um, you're right. I mean, you, you're 100% right in everything you just said. I mean, my, um, I was born and grew up in West Philly, uh, Southwest Philly. Uh, my grandfather owned a, a bar on Woodland Avenue. Uh, and all of his customers, all of his customers were Eagle season ticket holders. And they all bought their tickets through him. Um, so that they could all sit in a big block at Franklin Field. Well, actually, Connie Mack Stadium first, and then Franklin Field, but they all bought their season tickets through him. Uh, and at one time, uh, he was the single biggest ticket holder on the Eagles books, uh, to the point where they offered him a chance to buy a piece of the team <laughs> at one time. And he said, um, no, I'm not quite there yet. Well, that would have, uh, he always regretted that. They had a chance to actually buy a piece of the Eagles and said no. Uh, but that was that was the way it was. I mean, all the guys that came in the bar, and I was in there from the time I was a little kid. There was nowhere else to play, so I just hung out at the bar. Uh, and every Sunday, you know, he would charter a P, what was then the PTC. A PTC bus would pull up next to the bar. Everybody would pile on, and off we would go to the to, off we would go to the game. And that was just how I was raised. I mean, my my grandparents were huge Eagles fans. My dad and mom had season tickets from the time dad came home from the war. Uh, and from the time I was like eight years old, I would just get on the bus with everybody else and go to the games. And my parents were such huge fans that uh, when my dad used to get his two weeks of summer vacation, uh, our summer vacation was going to Hershey and watching the Eagles practice because that's where training camp was back then. All and right, for well, a kid, it was just the greatest place in the world to be because there was no ropes, there were no fences, there was no security guards. I mean, you could just walk with the players, talk with the players, stand on the sideline and watch practice. Um, so it was a great place to be a young fan. And that was where I met Tommy McDonald, and that was where the story of Tommy and me really began. Let me ask you this. We're going to take a break right here, but when we come back, I've got a great story about the uh, Hershey. Wait, that's where the training camp was, up in Hershey, Pennsylvania? That's it. Okay. So when we come back, i got a great story on that, so does Ray, and we'll continue on with how he got to be Tommy McDonald's little errand boy with his helmet. We'll be right back after this.
So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. Boardwalks built for fun. Legendary rock and roll clubs. This is how we do it. Casinos by the ocean. Now that's New Jersey. 130 miles of beautiful beaches. Solid rock. And everything in between. <laughs> now that's New Jersey. Plan your New Jersey trip at visitnj.org. Waves of fun. Nights of excitement. And a trail of memories. Now that's New Jersey. Welcome back to Behind the Lines. I'm Kevin Riley again, and with me today, Ray Dittinger, and we just started getting into the storytelling about his play. Outside of being an author, and he's written the Philadelphia Eagles Encyclopedia, One Last Deed, Ultimate Book of Sports Movies with Glenn Macnow, and Finished Business, 50 Years of Headlines, Heroes, and Heartache, he is also a playwright. And I'm going to show you a little bit. You're going to see it right here. I think we have this somewhere else. He has written this show called Tommy and Me. And I'll just tell you how wonderful it is. I got to see it a couple years ago with Frank LeMaster. We took our wives. And the only reason our wives went out to see this play, which they thought would all be about football, which they were not interested in in the least, they thought at least they'd get a good meal out of it. And at the end of the night, I looked over to both of them as the curtains were coming down in the play, and there were two women wiping the tears away from their eyes. <laughs> Ray, you know, coming from Canton, Ohio, out there to see my buddy and your friend Harold Carmichael get into the Hall of Fame and seeing some of the alumni before. You know, something that happened to us when we were 25 years old, playing against each other, knocking heads in practice, if you ever told one of those guys, even after six or seven beers, that you loved them, you'd have got punched in the face. But every time we meet now and every time we leave each other, it's a big hug. We know where each other is. You know, you could be President of the United States, but they remember you when you were back in the day. That's who you are to them. And, you know, it's just a funny because John Bunning and, and Bill Berge and I were talking about it. When did we start this, hey, I love you stuff, but it's true and it's real. So you wrote this play, I know, with a lot of love. And why don't you give us, you know, the background on the story, how it got started with you and Tommy? Well, um, kind of like I was saying before the break there was, you know, my family used to go up to the Eagles training camp at Hershey, uh, 57, when he was a rookie. Um, he immediately became kind of my favorite player because he was this celebrated All-American from Oklahoma. He wasn't much bigger than I was, it seemed. Um, you know, some of these other guys were kind of intimidating with their size if you're nine years old. But Tommy just looked like you, you know. Uh, and he was just so friendly and so warm. Uh, and I waited outside the locker room, and he came out, and I asked for his autograph. Uh, and he said, the first thing he said to me, he said, yeah, sure, I'll sign. But, uh, you, you know, I got I to gotta keep walking here. You, you want to walk with me? Here, carry my helmet. 
Uh, and that was how it started. I mean, that day I, he handed me his helmet and I walked with him to the practice field and we talked. And uh, the next day I was there again and he handed me his helmet and we walked. And you know, we did that for two weeks until we had to go back home. And then the next year I came back to Hershey and we did it again. And then we did it again. And it became a, it became a thing. And, you know, he started calling me little brother. Uh, and uh, he was fascinated by the fact that I guess I was then a lot like I am now, um, that I just read everything and consumed everything. And my head was full of statistics and records and stuff. So, I, I mean, I literally knew stuff about him that he didn't know. I mean, we would have these walks and I would talk about records that he set and things that he did and talk about, you know, the 97 yard punt return against Colorado and things that he barely remembered. And I knew it all. And he just thought this was the funniest thing. And this little kid uh, knew everything there was to know about him. So that was how we met. And then later on, after Tommy's career was over and I had become a sports writer, I had occasion to interview him for various things, like the anniversary of the 1960 championship and all that stuff. Uh, and in the course of interviewing him, I, you know, I said, you know, I had a great career. Did, are there any regrets? And he said, well, you know, I, I kind of hope that I might get into the Hall of Fame, but you know, I guess some things just aren't meant to be. Um, and I just said, you know what? I'm a sports writer now. I'm a Hall of Fame voter. I want to try and get the ball rolling here to get this guy in the Hall of Fame. Not just because he was my boyhood hero, but because he deserved it. I mean, he was, he was a great player. Well, let me and stop. so I started working sort of behind the yeah. scenes to build some support and campaign for him. And, you know, 1998, it happened. He got voted into the Hall of Fame. And then he turned around and asked me to be his presenter. So, you know, there we were, you know, it started out with me carrying his helmet in Hershey in 1957 as a nine year old. And there we are 40 years later, riding in the parade at Canton on our way to the hall of fame. He's being inducted and I'm presenting him. I mean, that's sounds like a play to me. Sounds like a play well, to me, Kevin. You so missed. I sat down and wrote it and, um, I'm, I'm thrilled with the way it's been embraced by people. People really like it. And I've had talked to people that have come back every year. I've come back and seen it four years, and they're coming back this year for a fifth. Well, you missed one important part in that whole thing, which was just amazing to me. While you're interviewing him, and over a period of time, you never told him you were that little boy no. that was carrying his helmet. Talk about that. Tell us what happened there and then what how he finally found out and how amazed he was. <laughs> he was amazed. Um, yeah, you know, all those intervening years um, and all the occasions I had to interview him, um, I, there was a part of me that said, maybe I should tell him you know, about our, our history back in Hershey, that I was the kid who carried on. My but then, to be honest with you, well, there was two parts. But number one, you're, you're a reporter now. And you, that, to me, you just don't want to kind of cross that line about saying, hey, remember when I was the, you know, you kind of want to keep it professional. That's part of it. But in truth, what I really was afraid of was that I would tell him if I ever really fessed up and said, you know, I waited for you outside the locker room and I used to carry your helmet. And I, and he said, yeah, yeah, I don't remember that. You know, I, that, would have been, that would have been like a stake through my heart, you know. So <laughs> rather than risk being disappointed, I just never said anything. Um, but when literally the day of his induction, we were in Canton, we were backstage just minutes away from walking on the stage. And I knew what Tommy had planned for out there and anybody that's seen it, they all know what he did on his hall of fame induction. He came out with the boom box, played the Bee Gees. He danced, he told jokes. It was a hall of fame acceptance speech, unlike any other. And I was the only one that knew he was going to do that. Uh, and I thought it was a really bad idea uh, and it could really wind up being a disaster. And I thought, I got to try and talk him out of this, but how? And so that day, standing there right before we walked on the stage, I said, you know, um, uh, back in the 50s, I was your biggest fan. And I used to wait for you outside the locker room. And, and he looked and he just got this look in his eye and he said, wait a minute, you were that kid. And so he put it all together. And I thought that maybe if I presented it to him that way, that I could convince him that this 
craziness that he was about to bring to the stage was a bad idea, that maybe he would listen to me now. Well, he didn't. I mean, he went and he did what he wanted to do anyway. Uh, but yeah, I just never told him all that stuff until that moment. But what amazed me was, I mean, he knew immediately. Uh, and he was amazed that that little kid that he remembered was the kid standing right in front of him in Canton. Wow, that's a really neat story. And, you know, you did your best to try to talk him out of giving this, you know, crazy uh, act. It wasn't even a speech, it was an act. He comes out playing the Bee Gees with the boombox on his shoulder. I think he uh, was chest bumping guys and one of them knocked him down on the stage and everybody was laughing in the audience. And <clears throat> as bizarre as it was, he had a reason for it being bizarre, didn't he? Yes, which I didn't understand. Um, I just thought it was just him wanting to have show off. Because Tommy was that way. I mean, Tommy was anybody that saw him play as a player. Um, he was flamboyant, and he did things differently. He, he was the first guy to score a touchdown and throw the ball into the stands. Um, he used to do the twist during pregame warm-ups. I mean, he, he liked, he reveled in the spotlight, and I thought this was just kind of the same thing. Um, and I wrote him a speech, and I kept handing it to him and saying, just do, read the speech, read the speech, don't do that stuff. Uh, and what he finally said to me was, he said, I can't. Don't you understand? I can't. I'm afraid. I'm afraid if I go out there and I start to try and read a speech, I'm going to get all emotional and I'm going to break down and I'm going to start crying. It's going to be on television. I'm not going to be able to finish and it's going to be embarrassing. The only way I can get through this is if I go out there and I have fun with it. Um, and the idea of him, and he was always, because he was a little guy and prided himself in being tough and being fearless, uh, you know, never back down, never show pain, that was his whole career, uh, and so he didn't want to get all weepy on the steps of the Pro Football Hall of Fame in front of all of his contemporaries, in front of all the other Hall of Famers. That would have really embarrassed him. So he thought, no, if I go out there and I dance and I tell jokes and I do that stuff, I can get through that. So it was just this fear of letting the emotion overcome him that prompted him to do what he wanted to do. And even though I, I tried to talk him out of it, um, he was determined. And, you know, bottom line, you know, happy ending. People loved it. I mean, the people laughed. They cheered. They thought it was so different. They thought it was so funny. But to me, it was just so Tommy. But the fact of the matter is, it was, people still talk about it to this day. Oh, I remember what Tommy McDonald, remember him? I mean, there have been a million speeches at the Hall of Fame, but there's never been another one like that. And people love that. And he loved the fact that people loved it. Well, Ray, thank you for that and sharing with us. That's kind of the synopsis of the story, but I'm telling you, it is a great play. It's going to be at the Delaware Theater uh, down in Wilmington, Delaware. Tickets are only $29 a piece. I guarantee you just a warm feeling will go through you if you come down and watch this uh, incredible story about him and Tommy McDonald and how their lives intermix during that period of the late 60s or early 60s all the way into the 70s. Great story, Ray. Thanks for coming on with me, and love to have you back in another time. I would love to do it, Kevin. Remind people that every show closes with a Q&A, and you are hosting one of those. I'm going to try, yeah. You know, I, I'm, you know I, I don't know if I have the answers like you do, but I can fake it sometime. I'm Irish. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to it, Ray. Until next well, week, am, this, is Kevin, this is Kevin Riley signing off for Behind the Lines.